Uh, hello, good evening, guys. Welcome to our second Friday talks, uh, Friday text for this end. And today is going to be about our sharing about project intern. And to begin with, let me just briefly introduce about our speakers. First, we have Azim, who is year three computer science. He's a NUS Hackers core team member, and he has previously interned at Govern Tech and Shopee. We also have another speaker, Noel, also from year three computer science. He's a NUS Hackers core team member, and his previous internships include NLP, Class 2 Foodies, Home Mass, and he's currently at Mutual Knowledge Systems. Let's welcome them. First, we will start from Azim. Hello, hi everyone. So uh, as Tising mentioned, I am a third year computer science student. Um, so today we'll be talking about uh, internships and everything surrounding them, or as much as we can cover to help you guys out. Um, so the agenda for today looks something like this. From now until about 7.50, we're gonna talk about what are internships, how do you, um, how do you apply for one, why you, should do an, um, why you should apply for one, and all the other related things. Then we're gonna take a break for about five minutes, and then we're gonna have a panel discussion with our panelists. So we've got a lineup of panelists uh, who are working in various tech companies. They are either full-time or they're currently interns and they've got a lot of experience. So we'll be asking them a few questions. And at the end of the whole thing, we will have a chance to uh, join a breakout room with them. And you can ask them questions in a smaller setting as well, right? Okay, so um, I am missing a slide. Okay, that doesn't matter. So uh, you can see this um, ask a question thing right at the top of my screen, right? So uh, you can just go to this link here and you can uh, ask any questions you want. And by uh, asking a question there, we can flash up on the screen as well. So feel free to ask whatever questions you want there. And then we can um, just flash them out and get the panelists to answer them as well. All right, so let's get started. Why should you do an internship? Um, there's this quote by Simon Sinek, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so therefore the why behind why we do an internship is important. Right. Uh, there are two arguments you can make for this. Uh, one is the obvious academic argument, right? So uh, you want to do an internship because it's part of your graduation requirements. So this is the CS computer science graduation graduation requirements. But the other computing degrees probably have something similar. If you are in uh, computer science, then you may need you need to do a total of twelve MCs of internships. Uh, so you can do two over summer. So uh, one twelve week, one over summer, another twelve week, one over a different summer break, or you can do one 24 week internship under the advanced technology attachment program, right? Uh, but on top of that, there is also the fact that everything you learn in school is a theoretical thing for the most part, right? And you kind of want to bring this into practice. So that's really important. And yeah, so you, you want to take your content into practice. And this is an opportunity for you to do that. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about um, what internships can do a lot, right? Uh, one of the very important things that you get a chance to do at internships is work at these other very big companies and you get a chance to really make an impact. Uh, these are some interns who were from NUS in the past. Uh, you can see Albertus at the end of his internship published a video on YouTube for Flutter. Um, Tan Iliang, who I think worked on NUS mods at one point and was NUS Hackers core team member, he uh, contributed to the Facebook React library as well. And uh, all these big companies, they usually talk about what their interns have contributed, their blog posts and things like that about um, their contributions. So you definitely do get a chance to make an impact at these companies because they want to train you to become better software engineers and at the end of the day, come back and work for them. Right? Okay, so, oops, yeah. The other thing, uh, big benefit of internships is that you get the chance to find out what exactly you enjoy in this area, right? Are you interested in operating systems? Are you interested in systems in general? Do you want to be a full stack developer? Do you want to work at a startup or do you want a big company like you know, one of the fine companies? Do you want to do software engineering? Do you want to do data? Do you want to do security? Internships are a very, very good chance for you to work in a sandbox environment for a good 12, 15 weeks and find out whether you like this domain and if you don't, then you have a chance to pivot during your educational years itself, right? The another chance, uh, another uh, major benefit of this is you get to know a lot of people. Uh, you, every time you intern, you obviously be working underneath an experienced engineer who will be your mentor, and you will get to learn from their experience. You will get a chance to meet these people. If you travel overseas, you'll make a lot of connections and networks with them. 
And these are people who are going to be in the same industry as you, which is really, really important, right? So uh, you get to learn from them and then they can become lifelong friends possibly if you guys are on the same frequency. So you have a lot of shared experiences with these people and it's really a fantastic opportunity to just know uh, who's out there, right? And there is, of course, the earlier that if you manage to go overseas, then you get a chance to explore the world. You get the opportunity to travel, which is something is sorely lacking in this COVID period. Um, but things are opening up and you can apply to these overseas companies, get a chance to see the world out there and figure out where you want to work also. Do you like the culture in a different place? Do you prefer working in an environment outside of Singapore? If so, where? Do you want to go to the Bay Area? Do you want to go to Europe? There's a whole bunch of things out there and it's a lot of time and space for you to explore in your university years. Okay, so um, on top of this, there's obviously the, the money that you get out of these internships and the perks as well. So um, one of the common questions is uh, what, what is the compensation like? And uh, there are websites that tell you that uh, crowdsource this data and you can find out how much interns get paid. So levels of FYI is the most common one. You can go visit it and go find out what the, the uh, salary tiers for different engineers are at uh, different companies. Uh, on top of that, you can also talk about, uh, oh, sorry, you can also learn about what the intern pay and things like that is going to be. So you can possibly start building a path towards a future career. Right. So let's say you want to work at Google in the future, then you could like maybe plan an internship in your third year and things like that. Um, most of the bigger companies also have great like welfare benefits. So uh, many of them have food uh, catered for you. So when I was at Shopee, breakfast and dinner was taken care of. Google is known for its fantastic food uh, that they, they provide their employees with. So all in all, it's a, it's a pretty fantastic experience uh, working at a lot of these companies. Uh, and so if this is alluring to you, then you're probably going to ask the question of how to get an internship, right? So obviously the first step is to apply, right? Uh, so how do you apply? Uh, there are many, many different places to apply. Uh, Intern Supply is one of the websites where people collate uh, internships. One of the ex core team members from NUS Hackers, Suyesh, has a page on his GitHub that lists the Singapore technical internships. And um, the University of Pittsburgh's uh, Computer Science Society, Computer Science Club, also has a page on GitHub talking about their summer internships. Uh, so it's, it's a really fantastic list. You can go and look at them and there's loads of companies there. So this makes your life a lot easier when you're looking for companies to apply for. Uh, there are also recruiting platforms. So there used to be a platform called Jumpstart that's renamed itself to canvas.com now. You can just go sign up there and recruiters post announcements for which companies they are um, they're, they're, they're recruiting for. So for example, Lyft uh, announced their recruitment on canvas.com. There's triplebyte.com, which also has the similar concept. Beyond uh, these recruiting platforms, the most common one is LinkedIn. Uh, I personally use LinkedIn a lot to find out when jobs are listed. So you can go to LinkedIn, just put like software engineer or software engineer intern into the job search, and you can just set your location. So I've got a job alert set for software engineering intern in Singapore, in the States and in Europe. And every morning I get an email telling me that, hey, these are the new jobs uh, available, whichever is interesting, I can go and apply. So I think it's some effort on your part to go and find these internships, but there are lots of platforms out there that make your life a lot easier. Um, you can also go and intern at many, many local startups. So Block71 is just near NUS and it partners with NUS Enterprise. You can go and find companies there which are just smaller startups instead of just bigger firms and have a chance to work with them instead, right? Tech in Asia also has a careers portal which is focused on smaller startups in Singapore and Glintz is a Singapore-grown startup that focuses on uh, helping people get hired. So there are many, many different types of companies out there. There's just bigger firms that I mentioned and the smaller startups within Singapore and overseas as well, right? Uh, and of course, if all of these things uh, don't give you what you're looking for, you can practice a core software engineering skill where you need to Google for things. So you can just honestly go to Google and type in like some company name and then followed by the word careers or internships, and you'll probably find something. Uh, something I did last year personally, I opened my phone, I looked at every single app I had, and then I said, would I be interested to work for this company? And if I said yes, then I would just type in the company's name into Google and add in the word careers at the end of that. So like I use Notion a lot. I emailed Notion and asked them, hey, do you guys have internship openings? They didn't, but this is one of the things that you need to do that if you're interested to work for some of these companies, you can just Google for them or drop them a cold email and ask them, hey, do you guys take interns? Right? So 
of course, one of the questions is if you're in year one, then what do you do, right? You don't have experience. By well, how can you gain experience? If you are in NUS, and I think many of you will be, then um, there is this thing called CVWO, Computing for Voluntary Welfare Organizations. CVWO is a really uh, good opportunity to get exposed to software engineering projects because you work with a real client. You look, work with voluntary welfare organizations, and this entire thing is managed by professors in SOC. So you get a chance to work on a project, you get to deal with a client, and you get to see a real code base. Uh, and this helps you build up your software engineering skills. If you don't want to work in a client setting and you want to explore a project on your own, there is also Orbital. Orbital lets you define your own project and you work over the course of the summer holidays to go and come up with something. And um, both of these things give you some MCs for it, but the MCs are not important. It's the fact that you get these experiences out of it. There are open source projects at NUS. So uh, things like NUS mods, teammates, and many others, these are all open source projects under School of Computing and you get a really good experience working with a big complex code base where many, many people are contributing to it. And this uh, software is used by many, many people. I mean, three, 700, three quarter of a million people use some of these products. So you get a chance to really make an impact. Lastly, there are also uh, startups in Singapore which are supported by NUS Enterprise. Many of them are housed at Block 71. And uh, you can go and work at these startups as well. So they are willing to take younger people in and train them and you get a chance to work on something that is very new and evolving. So there are definitely opportunities out there for you in year one as well. So when do you apply? The best time to apply definitely is now. And I don't mean this in, in, in a figurative sense. Many, many companies have started their recruitment. So now really is the best time to apply. And if you think you're not good enough, then that's completely normal. Everybody struggles. Everybody struggles a lot. And this is an experience that I think myself and Noel, the other speaker, and all the panelists have gone through. This is a very uh, familiar feeling where you think that you're not good enough, but that is normal. You will apply to many, many places. Uh, last year, I think I, I lost count of how many places I applied to, and many of them will reject you, but that is normal because you only need to get one of them to accept you, right? And honestly, the companies that, that reject you, they at least tell you they've rejected you. Many of them just straight up ghost you. And that happens too, but it's okay, right? It's an experience that everybody goes through because there is a huge demand for these jobs and it's normal to have this feeling, but just push through it and start the application process early and give yourself time to apply rather than rushing everything out over the course of one week or so, right? It's important to note that it's, it's a bar, not a race, right? You don't need to be the first person to apply. You don't need to be, um, you don't need to be a top 10% of your cohort or something of that sort. The companies all, when they recruit, they are looking for you to pass certain minimum qualifications. And if you hit the minimum qualifications, they will accept you, right? So the focus is on building the skills required to hit the minimum qualifications. So this is a common question, right? My resume is empty. I have nothing in it. I'm, I'm in year one. And so obviously we must prepare to apply. So what can you do to prepare to apply? As I've mentioned, the skills aspect of this is quite important. And the other thing beyond just building the skills is also showcasing your skills, right? So this is the, the experience of one of the seniors from NUS building, Adve. So he got an internship at Twitter after he just made a, a simple Tetris game and published it on his website. And when the interviewer spoke to him, the interviewer told him that, hey, I played your Tetris game and it was quite fun. By publicly showcasing what you have done, by publicly showing that you have these skills, it lends credibility to you and yourself as a software engineer, which helps a lot. So what if you don't know how to build a Tetris game? And that's fine. That's completely normal. And this is where we start, right? So there are loads of resources out there to help you get started. If you're interested in web development, the Mozilla web docs are absolutely fantastic for getting you started with uh, the basics of web development. They've got simple courses and tutorials you can follow to learn these things. If you're interested to do web applications, building the front end and the back end, the Odin project is, is really good because it's a structured course that teaches you how to build uh, the front end and the back end of a web application and goes through this process with you so you build these skills. If 
you don't want to do these things and you want to learn certain other technologies, there are many, many courses out there. Uh, Hacker School, which is conducted by NUS Hackers, we hold introductory workshops to various technologies over the course of the semester. Uh, this semester, in the first half, we're doing some intro to Python and data visualization. Um, and the second half of the semester, we're doing some web application and web development related stuff. In fact, our first workshop is tomorrow. But if you don't want to come to Hacker School, that's fine. There are loads of courses out there. Pick something that you're interested in and go and learn because that is how you can build these skills. Many of these things are not taught in school. And so you do need to make the effort to go and pick it up. But the content is definitely really, really accessible. So once you start learning these things, then of course you have to start building things to practice and, and gain this ability, right? So uh, the best time to build things is definitely now. And then the question is what to build, right? What can you build? So this is a very simple way of thinking about it. You can build solutions to problems you or others face. You can do this, build your own something, right? So if you go to this link later on, um, there's a whole bunch of tutorials on how to build your own compiler, how to build your own version of Git, how to build your own simple game, uh, and various other things. The whole point isn't to do something new or novel. The point is to go and try to build something that already exists. So you know, and you have the experience of building a similar system, right? And this gives you the ability to, to think and orchestrate solutions to other similar problems. And the place to start now is to start small and follow a guided tutorial to do these sort of things. You can also try contributing to open source projects. Uh, this gives you experience working with a large code base maintained by other people. And you also get exposed to things like coding standards and how these integrations work. There are loads of YouTube tutorials out there on simple things you can build too. I can share my own experience. When I first picked up web development, the first thing I did was I went to Twitter and I just tried to clone the look of Twitter in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So it's a very simple exercise, but it gets you familiar with layouts and understanding how uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript works. So nothing complex, but just get practicing. And that's very, very important. I'll share some examples of things that some of my friends have done. So when we talked about solutions to problems you face, one of my friends over summer built this website video, which is a copy of don't know how many other websites out there that download YouTube videos for you. Right, so um, you can just add the word DLN in front of youtube.com and it should link you to his website and you can download a video. And this is where you get experience figuring out how to build something simple like a YouTube video downloader. Uh, another friend of mine, he lives in an RC. And if for those of you guys who stay on campus, you might know that if you have an air conditioned room, you have this website you have to log into and uh, purchase aircon credits and check things like that. So he built a simple, um, Telegram bot that lets you uh, check your icon credits, right? So it's a very simple thing, but then you get oriented to Telegram bots and programming and logging into a website programmatically and things like that. Another friend of mine built a simple interpreter in Golang, right? Uh, it, he followed a book and then he had this interpreted language called Monkey. Uh, and the process of this wasn't that he did something new or novel. It was a process that let him learn. And that's important. Right. There are loads of other things you can try to. If you're not interested in this general software engineering line, if you want to go into machine learning, there is Kaggle. If you're interested in the algorithm side of things, there's Code Forces. If you guys are into security, there is or over the wire, and they have this bot, this war game thing, which progressively builds up your skill in capture the flag competitions, which is like in, uh, important in your security stuff. So there are loads of resources out there. And it is really important that you go through with them to go and um, build up your skills before you start applying to internships. So uh, once you're done with that, then you go back to application. And I think Noel, you can tell us more about that. Yep, thank you Azim. So I'll be covering the application side of things now. Um, one of the things that you will need uh, in your application process are referrals. So they can help you to skip the resume screening stage. And to get referrals, it will be very helpful to know your seniors because they can help you get referred. You can also reach out to recruiters um, and yeah, they might give you referrals as well. So yeah. Uh, so some examples of uh, core team members who have gotten referrals, it will help you to skip like um, uh, certain stages of the um, application process. So maybe the online assessment and so on. So 
this is especially important in larger companies where you know you have hundreds or thousands of applicants and um, yeah, there's quite high attrition rates for resume screening. So definitely reach out to recruiters or seniors to get a referral. Yeah, so note that um, referrals are not only, um, are just like uh, good to have. It's not really a must to have. Even if you don't have a referral, you can still try applying and yeah. So the next thing that you will need is a well-crafted resume. And the very first thing you are probably wondering is, you know, what you should include inside your resume. Um, so this is a very helpful resource. This is from Yang Shun's uh, Tech Interview Handbook. And inside here, they cover topics like um, what you should include in your resume, specific sections, how you should order them, as well as um, the perspective of the recruiters. Like uh, what are they looking out for, right, in, in candidates. The next resource is Kenneth's. So he's also a panelist with us uh, and you will get to ask him questions later today. Um, so this resource covers uh, Kenneth's journey from year one to year four uh, in computer science and shows how his resume actually evolved um, over the years. Yeah, so this is actually quite helpful in showing you, I guess uh, it's kind of like a walkthrough, right? To show you what you can do to get to the next stage. And also if you don't have much things to show, what can you use to fill in the gaps in your resume? So now that you know what you should include in your resume, um, yeah, you will start to craft your resume. And uh, to do that, uh, we will actually recommend uh, off-the-shelf off solution. So you can look at popular resume templates like um, those from GitHub, or you can just get it from Overleaf. Uh, even Google Docs has some template uh, resumes. So yeah, you can just Google for this and uh, just pick the one that suits your needs. Uh, also note that your resume should be like uh, at most one page long. Um, generally, if it's more than one page, it's because, if, it's because you have a few years of experience, but I think that's usually not the case for interns. Uh, additionally, recruiters just skim through and they might even skip your resume if it's like two page long. Yeah. So something to take note of. Uh, yeah, so as previously mentioned, cover letters are not like really necessary. Um, and also, if you are to craft a cover letter, make sure that it's specific to the company you're applying for. Don't just send the same templated cover letter to every single company, right? Recruiters can tell if you do so, and it will probably leave a bad impression. Okay, so the next step is the interview. Um, so the standard process that most companies go through is that uh, you will submit your application and then you'll get past, uh, and if you get past resume screening, you'll get an online test. So this takes place on HackerRank or other uh, online coding platforms. And then if you get through that, you will probably get a face-to-face -face or uh, Zoom interview. So this is generally the case for, I think, medium to larger companies. Yeah, so note that this is not the only process around. Um, sorry, this is not the only process around. Some companies also do like um, ask you about the projects you did or ask you technical trivia. Um, yeah, so the, the process differs from company to company. So how can you prepare for these technical interviews? So um, again, you can look at Yang Shun's tech interview handbook. Here, uh, he covers the important questions and topics that you should cover. He also, he also talks about um, regular patterns that, that show up in uh, technical interview questions. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a quite a concise version. And yeah, so I would recommend that um, well, you go through this, also track your progress, like create a spreadsheet or something to see um, when you should revise certain questions and uh, yeah, make your preparation systematic. So the next thing you can look at is the Asana technical interview guide. So this actually talks about the soft skills aspect of your technical interview, right? Like um, how can you best interact with your 
uh, interviewer, um, um, the, important of, the importance of frequent communication during your interview and various other aspects. Yeah, so there are many kinds of questions, algorithms, algorithm questions, which was previously mentioned, and this is done very often. At 2040, if you are in NUS, uh, CS 2040 will help you prepare for this. So make sure that you, you, know, you put in uh, effort into that. Um, and so applying for jobs is pretty much a numbers game. So you should do the algorithm questions so, just so that you can have more options right, when you're applying. Uh, yeah, so you can also look at uh, CTCI. So this is used more of a reference material. Um, one of the previous resources which I shared, I think the Yangshun's Tech Interview Handbook actually takes some um, uh, material from this and condenses it down. So you might want to look at this as reference. Yeah. And so the other resource is the code. Um, so there are specific uh, problem sets that you can look at. So the blind 75 problem set. So this is curated um, by, uh, by blind, by a Facebook engineer on blind, I think. And uh, the second one is uh, curated by Likud. So you can look at these problem sets and solve them first, then move on to um, other questions. So other kinds of questions you encounter are system design questions. So um, personally, I haven't encountered this too much. Um, but I think if you are applying for uh, larger companies or full-time role, you will encounter this. Um, so to prepare for this, you can use this link here. You also can go to engineering blocks of big companies like Facebook, uh, Uber, and uh, Google, and so on. Uh, they usually cover some um, uh, system design topics on their development blocks. Um, yeah. So there's also code review where you walk through uh, with the interviewer uh, source code to flag certain um, code quality issues, um, efficiency issues, and so on. Bug hunting where you try to find bugs in source code. Online assessments. Usually this takes place during the first part of your interview as part of the screening process. Um, take home assignments. So uh, this can also be part of the screening process, but some companies might use this on later stages to further discuss your solution and to see your thought process and, des and the design principles you use. And of course, um, depending on what kind of role you are going for, they might test you, test you tech fundamentals as well. Um, trivia on operating systems, networks, these are the most common, but it might test you, uh, test you other kinds of uh, computer science knowledge as well, or web development knowledge, depending on what you are applying for. So usually this takes place during the last stage of uh, the interview process. So this is done in almost all companies. And this checks if you are a good fit uh, with the company. So these are some example questions that uh, interviewer will ask you. So the two things that you can prepare for are the scenario-based ones. So for example, tell us about um, the last time you recovered from a failure. And the other one is, do you have any questions for us? So for scenario-based questions, you can use this acronym to remember how to address the question. First, set the scene. Second, uh, describe the purpose, describe the problem you're solving, then explain the actions you did, right? And the rationale behind taking these actions. And lastly, share the outcome and the learnings you had from it. Yeah. So. Um, you also want to prepare questions to ask the interview, interviewer so that uh, you, know, you show that interviewer you're actually invested in um, what uh, the company is doing and you're actually interested in uh, asking the relevant questions. Right? So it also shows that uh, you are capable of critical thinking of certain aspects of um, your job. Yeah. So you can look at this resource as well from Yangshun to see uh, some sample questions to ask. So um, the next thing is, this is after you've probably landed your offer. Uh, this is quite important. So negotiation covers various aspects of your um, internship, but it's also widely applicable to other aspects of your life. Um, so um, in the context of internships, first you want to uh, negotiate, you, you probably want to negotiate your pay, um, the kind of work you're doing, 
um, where you are working, remote or on-site, and yeah, basically all of these things, right? Uh, because you'll be working there for an extended period of time, three months, six months, or even a year. So you want to make sure that you have the best experience. Um, yeah. So you can look at this resource from Adve, which talks about um, negotiation principles as well as resources that you can use. So also approach your internships with a problem-solving mindset. Um, as Azim earlier shared, when he was first looking for internships, he actually went through his phone to find applications that you know, he was interested in contributing to. Right? Similarly, Adve uh, had difficulty finding internships when he was year one, and he went to Block 71 to scout out uh, companies, and he managed to speak to a CEO and gotten his first uh, internship then. Right? Um, for me, I look into niche industries and apply to those. Uh, and there you have less competition as well, right? So there are many different ways you can approach this. So be creative about your job search and approach it with, uh, as, as though you are solving a problem. Yeah. So what are other things you might want to do instead of an internship, right? Um, so instead of internship, perhaps you also want to do your own project or you know, start your own startup if you have a problem you want to solve or a good idea, all right? So I do know of people who have had um, very fruitful experiences doing this. And um, do know that it's not one or the other. You can still do an internship along with your project or startup. Yeah, but these are equally fulfilling experiences as well that you can explore. So you can also do something else like research. So an example is the Europe program, which NUS has. So here you can actually um, take part in research under um, supervision of experienced researchers. And do note that you do have to have a decent GPA, I think 3.5 and above to take part, take part in this. So um, keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, you'll allow you to explore interesting technical topics. Apart from the Europe program, there are also usually open research positions that are available in many universities. So just apply for this. And the other thing you can do also is to speak to your professors and to ask them about um, the work they are doing, right? And if you're interested, you can join them. And if there's a, yeah, if there are opportunities available, just join them, yeah. So of course, you also want to spend more time with your family um, because you'll be working for quite a while, right? Like um, probably uh, the rest of your SOC life, you'll be either schooling or doing internships and things like that. So you might want to take some time to spend with your family and this is important as well. Yeah. So um, the last things are the words of wisdom, sorry, that I will share with you all. So luck favors those who are prepared. Um, yeah, it's self-explanatory. Everyone can be up there and uh, note that the journey will be tough and the definition of success is defined by yourself, right? It's subjective. Yeah, but everyone can make it as long as you put in the work and the effort. So um, another thing which, which ties in with that is to do so purposefully, to know, you know why you are doing uh, an internship. It may or may not be the end goal. Um, personally, for me, internship is a stepping stone, right? Towards um, something else. So think about um, why you are doing an internship, right? To get this long-term motivation. And of course, be creative and entrepreneurial in your job search to have the higher success rates. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's all. Uh, we'll now take a five minutes break. And after this, we'll come back for the panelists, uh, for the panel discussion. And yeah, see you all later in five minutes. So, so I, I think, think we can, can begin in about around 7.44. Yep, let's see everyone back here at 7.44.
by the way, guys, um, we will be answering questions from the q &A link. So uh, if you guys want to ask questions while waiting, before we start, you can drop your questions there. Okay, I think we can get ready to start. So um, the first thing we're going to do is just introduce our panelists. Uh, so let's get started with that. Our first panelist is Kenneth. Kenneth, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kenneth. Uh, nice to be here. And uh, yeah, so a bit about me. I'm a software engineer at Asana. I'm currently based in SF. Um, I was in NUS a couple of years ago, um, and I did a bunch of internships as, uh, in Singapore and in the US. Um, one thing I'll mention here is I actually did my uh, first internship in year three, so pretty late. Um, I wrote a bit about this in my post, uh, Evolution of Resumes, but I can talk more about that journey later on if there's interest from the audience. Uh, but ultimately, I was pretty fortunate that everything worked out well for me. Um, yeah, and I care a lot about some of these things right here on the slide. Um, and I'm pretty uh, active in the Project Intern Telegram group, right? And uh, I'd love to help everyone uh, put your career journey more intentionally. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, our next panelist is Valerie. Yeah, hi, everyone. So I'm from year four business analytics. So a bit of a different background from the other panelists here. And as you can see, my internships have been a little bit mixed. So I've had some experience doing data analytics and data science work, and also doing some coin research and trading. So I tend to be more slanted at with a financial angle. So you can ask me more about things related to business analytics or related to applying in finance. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Valerie. Next, we have Herbert. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, I hope you all can see me. But like, my name is Herbert. I graduated from NUS 2020. Uh, and yeah, I'm currently in this local startup called Traverse Technologies. Previously, I've done a few internships here and there. Uh, you know, I basically can't really figure out where I wanted to go until I decided that startups is the thing for me right now. So yeah, so I'm in Traverse right now. 
I was I just hackers core team member and like this is me in hack and roll, which is our annual hackathon. So please do join hack and roll. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. <coughs> uh, William. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Uh, I think I'm uh, Sorry. Mm. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi everyone, I'm William. Uh, so I graduated from NUSCS uh, last year. Um, and then I, so I did most of my internships at the same company, so Jump Trading, which is also where I'm currently working right now. Um, but uh, I did sort of uh, roll around various different departments and did uh, quite a lot of different things in Jump Trading um, at various uh, offices as well, because they all focus on different things. So, um, so that's sort of my internship experience. Uh, and I guess, uh, so I'll probably take questions more of the high frequency trading aspect of it. Um, so I jumped around quite a lot, so I probably can give a bit more answers there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Ahan. Hey everyone, I'm Ahan. I'm actually a CS year five student um, because I took one year, uh, one semester of LOA. I've actually um, done uh, three internships in software engineering. One at a startup, uh, NinjaVan, one at big tech at Google and one in finance um, uh, at Citadel. Um, and I've also had a bit of like a convoluted um, college journey. Um, I have interleaved in this like a lot of research gigs here and there. And my research also spans like uh, multiple domains from like pure, uh, pure theory to very, very applied system stuff. Um, but I guess my current interest is in the area of machine learning systems. So like I'm, I'm uh, feel free to ask me questions about like research against software and like how I ended up in um, these internships as well. Okay, thank you very much, Ahan. Uh, next we have Johanna. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Johanna and um, I'm currently year four CS. So this summer I'm interning in Google and I did my ATAP in Rakuten Viki. And then in year two, I um, intern in a startup called Viz AI as AI Dialogue Engineer. And in year one, I went for NOC to Indonesia and intern in a startup called Jala. Yeah. Thank you very much, Johanna. And then now we have Yutron. Uh, actually, Yutron is not able to make it today, I think. Um, okay, Jethro. Hello. Uh, yeah. Can see the see. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a uh, previously I intern at uh, Carousel doing uh, SWE and data science, hey. and then and then uh, in, also intern at Twitter for doing data science. Um, then post graduation, I uh, I worked as a research assistant for a while, continuing my work on uh, my robotics work uh, that I did during my FIP. But now I'm a machine learning engineer at ByteDance. Okay, thank you very much, Jethro. And then uh, lastly, we have Francis, who I think is sitting in the same room as everyone else, right? Yes, he is. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, I'm Francis, um, and uh, I studied computer engineering um, a while back, and uh, I have interned at um, DSO doing some cybersecurity stuff. And um, more recently, I've been doing a lot of um, AR, VR um, related work, uh, as you can see on my internship and my current job as well, and the KONUS uh, Cube Center. Yeah, so if you've got anything about computer engineering or like uh, yeah, VR stuff, you can ask me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Okay, so I'm going to flash the highest voted question we have here. Uh, and I think it's a very common question, something I had as well. So um, should I start applying now, even though I haven't practiced gate code or data structures and algos? I'm afraid I won't be ready for the technical round if it comes early. Um, okay, who wants to take this? Okay, I guess, uh, Kenneth, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so, uh, I think there are sort of two schools of thought here. Um, there are some people that might say, you know, it's better that you don't apply until you're ready because uh, you might waste the chance to interview with a company if you get an interview. Um, I personally subscribe to the second school of thought, which is um, 
failing technical interviews is also part of preparation, right? And so if you don't apply early, um, you don't even get the chance to interview sometimes. And even if you're not, like, even if you don't think that you are fully prepared, and to be honest, nobody really is fully prepared for interviews, um, you going through uh, interviews and even if you don't do well, right? Or who knows if you do well, um, it's still gonna be a great experience. Um, and I think we should all embrace uh, this process. Okay, thank you very much, Kenneth. Um, Herbert, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, <clears throat> so I think if I can add to Kenneth's answer, which is already pretty great, is that uh, <clears throat> it's like, I mean, it all depends on how much time you have and like how much, you know, kind of like budget that you have. I mean, mostly time. Lah. It's like, you know, <clears throat> like, uh, I mean, after all preparation, you can, there's like a lot of stuff that you can prepare, right? And if you feel like, you know, like uh, you'll prefer doing, for example, type projects first or whatever first, then like, I think by all means, you can also go ahead. Having said that, uh, you know, <clears throat> like I also kind of have the same thought with Kenneth in the sense that, you know, if you feel like, you know, uh, I think, yeah, I, I think, I think like, you know, getting interviews in internships are, and like, even if you fail them in the end, are also pretty good experience because I think, uh, you know, like internship, internship interviews are rather unique. Uh. It's not something that, uh, you know, you can experience a lot of it, I think. Uh, and like, I think having more practice of it is always great. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So I guess the 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 idea is to definitely take um just take the shot and then see what happens from there. Uh, but whatever limited time you do have, go and spend time to prepare. Uh, okay. So let's go to the next question. Um, so are there bigger tech firms out there that place emphasis on systems design rather than data structures and algos? If DSA is not your strong suit. Um. Okay, Valerie, do you have some thoughts on this? Because I think you've done something outside of just the normal software engineering stuff, right? Yeah, but I don't think I have experience with systems design specifically, but at least for my experience in finance, most of them want, most of them have like super days or look at your personality first and then they will ask you about your prior projects. So it's good to have, let's say, work that you've done before in either in other companies or as your own side projects to kind of demonstrate that you have the skills that are necessary. And from my experience, let's say applying to quant firms, a lot of quant firms like to ask about probability and stats and sometimes data structures and algos as well. But I found that just play to your strengths, like with the interviewer ask you what you're interested in, just don't say that you're interested in algorithms and they'll tend to ask you fewer questions with relations to that. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Kenneth, do you have some thoughts on this as well? Yeah, I can add to uh, so the experience of uh, interviewing at a wide range of companies. Um, I think there's sort of two parts to this. Uh, I think looking at the size of company, um, I think larger companies tend to have a more structured recruiting and interview process. And uh, there's also the second sort of point here about um, what stage of, uh, or like what experience level uh, the candidates are. So for interns and new grads, their questions tend to be more focused around data structures and coding more so than this uh, system design. I think the design questions tend to come up more as, your, uh, as you get more experience in the industry. Um, so I think most companies, uh, when, when it comes to like interns or new grads, are still going to be asking uh, data structures and algorithms questions for software engineering roles. Uh, however, there are some companies uh, that focus a lot on uh, collaborating on a problem uh, designing uh, a system rather than necessarily coding. And I can name some of these companies. Uh, they are like Palantir, Asana, uh, Stripe, tend to ask questions that uh, are more than just your 
uh, garden variety DSA question. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Kenneth, since you're here, I've got another question which I think you're quite well suited to answer. Um, so how hard is it to apply for a job overseas, let's say in SF or New York as a software engineer, and would they consider us if we are Singaporeans? Given that you are a Singaporean in Asana, I think this is a great question for you to answer. Yeah. Um, so I guess overseas here mainly refers to US uh, companies, although US is definitely not the only uh, tech hub outside of Singapore. Um, so US immigration policy is very messy and there's lots of historical baggage there. Um, and so lots of companies, you know, they want to hire talent from all over the world, but they can't because of uh, immigration policy and uh, restrictions over there. Um, I'd say that if you are trying to apply for a job uh, from outside of the US, so let's say you're in Singapore uh, and you're and you want to get a software engineer job or a tech job in the US, uh, you are fundamentally going to be disadvantaged. I think that's uh, the sort of real talk here. Um, there's sort of a few exceptions. Um, firstly, uh, for experience roles, so I, I know this is not relevant for the pan, uh, for this session, but um, I thought I'd just provide some context anyway. Um, for experience roles, so engineers with four or more years of experience, um, there tends to be a uh, very high demand, uh, but not a lot of uh, candidates out there. So these are the sort of roles that companies are more willing to consider candidates outside of the US because they want to expand the talent pools. Um, in that sense, they'll also be willing to take more risk with um, possibly not being able to uh, have those candidates get uh, work authorization. Um, depending on whether they get the uh, visa or not, uh, which is through a lottery process that's not controlled by the companies. Um, getting a uh, early career role like internships or new grads uh, from outside of the US is definitely possible. Um, I think there's sort of a few routes here. Uh, one way is to uh, perhaps intern at a uh, or interview at a company that has a, a US company that has a Singapore branch and try and negotiate for a uh, full time role overseas if you have a successful internship. I think it's one path. Um, there are also some companies that are uh, receptive to hiring uh, from overseas. I think there isn't really a good way to tell which companies are willing or not. Um, but that's just one thing to, to consider. In terms of this, the Singaporean factor, um, I do want to point out that as a Singap if you are a Singaporean citizen, uh, for full-time work authorization, you have access to this special type of visa called the H1B1. I won't go too much into it, but you basically have guaranteed work authorization unlike um, candidates from other nationalities. Um, a lot of the concern around not hiring outside the US is because or even interns, right? Because even if interns have no issue getting work authorization, the goal of hiring interns is to make sure you can uh, convert to full-time, right? Like that's the primary goal of uh, companies in the US running internship programs. Um, and if you in some of your application process, maybe try and educate a recruiter that, hey, you know, I'm, even though I'm outside of the US right now, uh, I have access to this full-time visa and, um, I will be eligible to come back full time uh, more easily. Right? So that could be one uh, way to boost your chances uh, applying from outside of the US. Uh, thank you very much, Kenneth. The next question is an interesting question. Uh, let me just bring it up. Okay, so this question is directed to Valerie and Johanna. As a female in tech, are there any additional insights you have on the tech internship process? Was there something notable about your experience interning at these great places? Um, would any of you guys like to start? Okay, I can start first. So um, in terms of the tech internship process, I can talk about Google's. So actually I've heard that some people say um, it's easier for girls to get into Google. But to be honest, um, I personally feel that 
that's not true because um, I know um, some people who are um, better but still got rejected. So it's actually um, not really based on gender. Um, you don't really have an advantage in terms of that. Yeah. And um, about um, something notable about my experience. Um, okay, maybe it's just a fun fact. Um, in my team, um, I'm in the GPA support and tools team. So um, initially before I joined, there's only one girl in my team. So now that I'm leaving the internship, yeah, she's the only one left. So um, in, in some teams, um, there are really um, a lack of girls, but I would say that there are also a lot of girls um, stepping up um, in the teams or being managers as well. And in places like Google, they actually have um, a strong community of women in tech, um, especially um, girls in software engineering. So they usually um, hold um, annual lunch, but um, sadly this year it's canceled or other activities as well um, focus on girls. So yeah, that's what I can share um, yeah, in terms of my experience in Google. Yeah. I guess I can add on a little bit. I think for me, I have not tried applying to like women in tech programs, but I do know there are some companies with those that you can possibly try applying to if you are a female, but I haven't found that the interviewing process has been any different from me versus my male friends. And then in terms of internship experience itself, similar to Joanna, I think I'm pretty much usually the only female in the team, or at most there'll be like one other girl, but I haven't really found that this was a problem in terms of interacting with the team. And yes, I faced like sexist remarks before, but it's not something that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think most people in general are really accepting. So I haven't really had that problem. Okay, thank you very much, Valerie. Um, the next one I'm going to present is a bit more directed towards the, the application process as students. So how do you balance applying for internships and the heavy academic workload at the same time? Uh, Ahan, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, I guess if you're a year two or a year one in semester two and you're taking um, like, a, a, like a module like 2040, well, then it goes hand in hand with uh, sort of applying for um, internships and preparing for the interview process. Um, but uh, other than that, there's some things that um, you can do. For example, what, what, what I used to do is um, be cognizant of the fact that a little bit of effort weekly makes a huge difference. Um, you don't have to, of course, sit down and um, go at it five hours a day every Saturday. Um, I'm talking about perhaps um, setting a goal of one lead code question or one um, code forces question if you're interested in algorithms um, every two days. Um, so you don't have to spend um, an enormous time, um, uh, amount of time um, focusing on the interview process um, at a time when you have a very, very high academic workload. Um, that is to say, though, um, I, I would highly encourage um, at the beginning of the semester, um, putting in a little bit more effort um, when students are relatively more free before midterms um, kick in. So yeah, I guess um, uh, to, the, the TLDR is a little bit of effort every day makes a large difference. Okay, um, Herbert, do you have some thoughts on this as well? Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, I think what, what Ahan said is uh, good. You know, like I just want to add a little bit in the sense that I think uh, at least from my empirical observations and my, from my own experience, like I know that a lot of people like struggle doing this because like indeed, like, you know, like, uh, <clears throat> I mean, academic work, academic workload is one thing, right? It's like you study, right? And like applying for internships is like, you know, like a uh, kind of a different process, right? Cause like you, 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 like you go to company web pages and like apply for them and then like you need to practically code and whatnot. Uh, yeah, lo, I mean like <clears throat> in the end, I guess it's just about time and like there is no easy answer, I would say. It's just, I think I just want to say that, you know, like it's like something that a lot of us uh, have the same problem and a lot of us also suffer through. And like, I mean, in the end, we do need to make some compromises. Uh, basically. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so it's, it's really a balancing game then. Um, this next uh, I like to uh, offer. Is... Uh, oh, yes, please go I, ahead. I actually like to offer a, a spicy opinion on this question. Um, I think 
consistency is definitely important. Um, but when it comes time to uh, like peak internship periods or peak preparation periods, um, I think that spending time on application and preparation for internships, uh, interviews is going to be far more valuable than uh, spending time on academics. Um, and I say this also uh, with the context that companies care more about your skills and uh, the interview process more so than your grades. Um, and at some point, this question is going to come, oh, like how much does CAT matter? Or like how much do, do your grades matter? Um, I think it only matters to the point where uh, is it a signal of how well you have learned in school? And so when it comes to balancing, I would advocate for uh, focusing on learning well in terms of your academic commitments and maybe for like assignments uh, and like things that you do to like, that may not be as valuable for learning, uh, but you kind of have to do for grades, maybe prioritize those less. So a bit more of a spicy way of balancing. Okay, so focus on the learning or focus on getting the skills that will also help you rather than just chasing the grades during the academic period. Um, okay, cool, cool. Uh, the next question is directed towards Francis, who works in AR and VR. Um, so hi, Francis, what is your experience like working in an AR VR company? And are there lots of such opportunities for us as software engineers? Francis, would you like to take this? Yeah, um, I think for me, the experience is... Um, it's very exciting because then this technology is relatively new and also it's like sort of like a new buzzword nowadays, right? And uh, admittedly, there are very few um, companies that are uh, doing AR-VR and hiring aggressively. So it might be a bit difficult to land jobs in these places and they typically are game development in nature as well. Um, so if you are looking for like a traditional software engineering role, um, you're not going to look at, you're not going to find it there la, because um, the kind of uh, technologies that they use is rather different in my opinion um yeah so are there a lot of opportunities not really um but there are there are some um the ones that i i did um are within nus but they they don't pay as well as the other software engineering roles because it's just a lab in nus but there are definitely opportunities uh, if you're willing to take the pay cut but it's exciting because you get to try new technology right yeah Okay, cool, cool, cool. So exciting new space to enter. Uh, the next question is directed towards William. Uh, William, how does the interview process differ for places like Jump and what kind of things should I practice for? Uh, okay, so um, for Jump, Jump specifically, we, uh, I guess we don't really have a specific, say, you know, software engineering role in that, in that sense. Uh, so we split more into... Um, so what we call like core, core engineering, and then we have like network engineering, systems engineering, and so on and so forth. And the application process of each is kind of separate. Um, so um, it is a bit more friendly, I guess, if you, let's say for people who are not so um, inclined towards DSA, um, there are actually other sort of venues, uh, sort, sort of other uh, things you can, sort of roles you can apply for. Um, and so if you're looking to more of the more technological side, so like say systems or like network, then of course, um, you know, it will more be like things like trivial knowledge on that end. It will be a bit of coding, a bit of say, you know, automation and opera operations handling in general. So that tends to be the interview process for the uh, more technical side. And then for the one slightly closer to software engineering, we have, um, uh, it, so the, the first few rounds, I think, are pretty similar to what most uh, other tech firms are doing. So we do the usual like lead code um, and then the face-to-face the -face round. Um, I would say for this one, um, it is sort of mostly similar. Uh, so it's, um, we do ask some DSA questions um, and then after, and some system design questions, but uh, there's a I guess a much wider range of technical trivia that you ask. So we tend to be, uh, ask a bit on networks uh, and also focus more on, you know, as you, as, as you could, like, you know, um, sort of uh, the things that you focus on, like, you know, how, um, you know, what, in what ways your codes are optimized and stuff like that. So 
Um, so that's more of the side. Uh, so I would say what kind of things you should practice. Um, it's a bit hard to tell, I guess. Uh, it um, sort of making sure your fundamentals are strong in, in sort of the main areas of CS or networking and systems and all that um, is sort of the best you can get. I don't think there's a spe specific area you can uh, sort of or there's resources for it, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's the third side, right, which is the quant side, which I think um, probably very, Valerie can answer in a bit more detail. But from what I know, um, uh, they tend to ask. So there's the math side, which is you uh, do more of the probability and statistics kind of stuff because you'll be analyzing market data. So there's that end. And then on the software end, um, it's tend towards data analytics. So probably they will ask you more towards like, you know, how to process large amounts of data in Python. Um, or other related languages like R or whatever. Um, so it tends towards that aspect and then a little bit of software engineering, but not so much. Yeah. So I think, William, you brought up a good point that uh, there is a difference between uh, training firms like Jump and the quant firms. And there's another related question. So maybe yourself and Valerie can stick around for that. So what is the difference between being an engineer or scientist at a tech company versus a quant company? And is financial knowledge important to progress? Uh, either of you can take this first. Uh, okay, I guess I'll continue down here. So um, what's the difference uh, for an engineer perspective? Uh, for, so um, I would say if, as a, so if you are as a, like a software engineer, that's sort of a core engineer myself, I don't need that much finance knowledge. Um, most of the stuff you need, you can pick up, I would say on the go. Uh, but you also don't need to understand it that so you definitely need some basic understanding, but um, you don't need to have as much in depth as if you were, say, um, working as part of a trader or whatever. Uh, so I would, uh, it's not uh, strictly necessary. You can sort of get by with just, you know, sort of basic understanding or like asking around, I would say. Um, so the finance knowledge is probably not as important. Uh, but of course, we also have the site where, as in, in Jump, we also have people who apply for, we have the trader engineering roles, right? Which is you sort of do, you're sort of an engineer for the trading side. Uh, and those, uh, if, you are, if you apply there, you tend to need a little bit more finance knowledge um, uh, because you're working directly with, with trading and sort of, um, you know, the sort of the uh, more like stocks aspect of the, of the company. So, then in that sense, you would tend to need a bit more. So it sort of depends on which area of the company you're working in. Um, and in terms of the difference, I wouldn't say quant companies and tech companies are uh, particularly different uh, from if you're just working on the engineering side, uh, they're actually mostly similar. Um, and every, I would say every quant company is still, is as diff, it, there's uh, an equal amount of variety between quant companies as you would have tech companies. Right, so I specifically don't really work on full stack development because I don't do any web facing applications. So I tend to work more like fully on sort of back end, back end like back end style software style kind of applications. But there are also companies out there who would do more of the full stack development. So in that sense, I would say it's not uh, super different. Thank you very much, um, Valerie. Do you want to add yeah, something? I think I'll contribute this? the data science perspective. So I think from, for data science, you tend to be working more on larger scale, longer term projects. Whereas as a quantitative researcher, you are working on different data sets every day. And it, you're basically just trying to find alpha or build models that will be able to tell you whether you should long or short specific equities. So it's more, I would say it's more fast paced and you are working with a lot more data than a lot more different types of data, I would say, than you would as a data scientist on a, on a given day. And then in terms of, is it important to have finance knowledge to progress? I think during my application stages, it wasn't important to have finance knowledge, but it was important to have a strong understanding of probability stats and some algorithms as well. And I think finance knowledge is seen more of as a bonus. And even as a quant research intern, finance knowledge helps you in understanding how to evaluate the models that you produce, but it's not, say, pivotal in your job. 
Okay, so would you say it's something you can sort of pick up while you're there? Yeah, definitely. I think anything you can ask, and at least for most companies, researchers usually get attached to a portfolio manager or a trader as well. So the traders or portfolio managers will usually explain certain concepts that they've discovered along the way. So that's mm. usually how you pick up financial knowledge. Cool, cool. Thank you very much. The next question is quite highly voted up. How do you deal with imposter syndrome and the imposter reality of not being good enough for a competitive process? Um, Herbert and Jethro, do you guys want to take this? Or maybe I can take this question. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, Johanna and Ahan. Sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, no worries. Okay. So uh, maybe as a background, um, okay, my cap is not spectacular and there are a lot of friends who are better than me. And then when I stalked uh, my fellow interns LinkedIn, oh my God, they were so up. So um, imposter syndrome is really real in Google where everyone is so smart and maybe everyone is expected to be smart. So how I dealt with imposter syndrome personally is um, I try to learn how to learn. So um, let's say I take a few hours to debug something and then um, maybe my fellow intern or my supervisor can um, solve it in five minutes. So it's very easy to say that, okay, I'm, not, I'm just not good enough and um, they are just smarter and that's why they can solve things faster. Um, so what I tried to do is um, to ask them what is their thought process and what are the steps that they take to, um, to end up um, where they are or to get the information that um, we want. So by learning the thought process, um, we can also learn um, the steps that we need to take next time so that we can also um, get the answer that we want. So yeah, that is um, how I dealt with imposter syndrome. And secondly, it's to sort of know what I don't know and then work from there ask questions about how to um, how to answer the things that I don't know. Yeah, so that's how uh, I try to deal with imposter syndrome. Okay, so learning how to learn and finding out more from your peers and colleagues. Ahan, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, yeah, I think what Joanna said was, was really accurate, but um, just to sort of add on, I think it's really important to realize that um, if you feel imposter syndrome, you're not the only one. A lot of people feel it as well. And so um, you should kind of, um, it's, a, it's a very normal thing to feel, first of all. I feel like um, a lot of people feel like um, they're the only ones who are not good enough and they feel like they're sort of isolated away from everyone else. So I think that's something that's really important to realize in order to combat this. And, and second of all, as well, is to really approach um, things that you may not potentially be good at compared to your peers or compared to your manager with a very um, sort of growth mindset. Uh, not to think that you're not good enough, but rather how can you learn from someone who's better than you? So I think um, like really those two things, realizing that um, I'm not in this alone and um, approaching it from really this sort of growth mentality um, has really helped me um, uh, level my skills up and, and, and deal with imposter syndrome. Okay, so I think that's quite helpful, realizing that you're not the only one. And as Joanna said, learning how to learn. Um, another very highly voted question is unemployment. Or is employment related? So is unemployment com common amongst NUS competing graduates, given how hard it is to get an internship? Um, Herbert, do you want to take this first? Sure. I mean, I guess I would say that in some sense, <laughs> I'll say in some sense it is kind of related to the imposter question just now, which is like, I think in general, it's, uh, how to say, like kind of nice to have a, a reality check, I guess. I mean, it's like, you know, like there are like 900 people in the current batch, right? And then like in this call, there's like only like what, 100 people or something like that, right? So in some sense, by virtue of you being here, you are likely going to be around the top 15% already, right? In that sense, because like, you probably don't, uh, but as much probably so it's like you know like i think i think the reason why i feel like uh when i talk to uh juniors and like college students right now it seems like the general vibe is that the process is really competitive and 
uh, you know, like, like, seems like everyone is like trying to chase uh, like a pretty good notion and whatnot. And like, I do recall distinctively that uh, around my batch, this is not really the case, uh, but someone can correct me. But I mean, I guess we also, uh, like people around my batch still like try to find the ships and I try to get good ones, but like, it feels like uh, I hear a lot more of these comments in the current students, you know, it's like, you know, like it's, it's cutthroat and whatnot. And it's like, I mean, I guess, uh, it's like if you're aiming for the internships in like you know the top companies and like uh for whatever definition of your top right like uh the spots might be limited but like in the end you know <clears throat> uh in the end i think uh not a lot of people actually get an internship among the pool of like cs students and like uh <clears throat> you know like it's like I don't think uh, the job market is so competitive that there will be a lot of people unemployed, and this is kind of backed by the what is it the job market data that NUS releases every year. That I don't remember the name, uh, but like, I think the past year data is like the NUS computing graduate that got a job is like ninety seven ninety eight percent or something like that, which is actually very very high compared to other faculties. So uh basically i don't think you know like it's like <clears throat> if you don't get an internship i don't think that means that like, you are like doomed for life or whatever like you know like those that get an internship it probably gets a head start in life and like in the career but then in the end you know it's like i i know a few people that you know like didn't do uh really good internships for whatever definition of good but in the end get to the big tech companies for example and like it's like it's like just how hard you want to study at some point or basically. Uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, true. Do you want to add something to this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'll answer the question very. Uh, I don't think unemployment is common at all. I think a lot of uh, like my peers are all unemployed. Uh, personally, because this is actually my second job, uh, I applied. I mean, um, I was a research assistant for a while and then I went on to join the industry. So actually, it, it isn't easy getting a job um, like in in the middle of like some weird time period. So a lot of companies they hold um like fresh grad recruitment season, like they have a fresh grad recruitment season. And that's when most people uh, get their jobs. So if you're you're applying, if I mean if you're thinking of like whether you get a job full time, then there, there's there are seasons just like internship seasons where you get you go and get your jobs. Uh. Uh, but the other thing is like I, I don't think unemployment is like 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 a bigger concern for me. Uh uh, compared to unemployment is is that like you, know, you, you gotta find a company that you enjoy like working with and this is like uh like internships are a really good like place to do this so you get to experience uh what's work what's it like working in a company and if you like it uh, like and they give you a return offer then uh it, it's great uh, yeah so so that's that's another reason like you, you should go for internships is to kind of experience uh, what the different different companies are like and whether you will enjoy working there also <coughs> Yeah, so to add on to Jethro's point, right, which I think is very good, right, is that I think I've, uh, at least from my observation, it seems like a lot of people are too focused on like <clears throat> uh, getting, you know, getting internships or flash jobs at the, you know, kind of like hot companies, which I guess is probably like Facebook, Google, uh, Apple, and I guess also like the trading companies and whatnot, like, you know, jump trading just now and like Jane Trade and whatever. And it seems like, uh like at least from my personal experience uh i think what's much harder to find is a company that uh resonates with you in that regard which is like for whatever definition that you have like maybe you enjoy the culture you enjoy the people around you uh you know like you enjoy the work that you've done and something like that and for my personal experience it's it is really really hard to get that right uh and like from my observation also it's like you know <clears throat> it's like not everyone uh like a lot of people don't find this in the hot companies i thought to speak i mean like a lot of people also do but the point is that uh um, across people it's like pretty different and yeah i mean like the point is to search all and like not to go to the hot companies for like prestige and whatever basically i hope that makes sense oh cool thank you very much Okay, so uh, we need to wrap up soon. So we have three last questions. And then I know there are lots of questions targeted at specific panelists here. 
uh, when we go into breakout rooms, I suggest that you guys go into those specific rooms to ask the panelists those questions. So uh, before we wrap up, three last questions. Um, okay, let's do this one first. Uh, year two CS, is there a point in me applying for internships now if the only experience I have is Orbital? Should I do some side projects and beef up my portfolio before trying to apply? Uh, Kenneth, would you like to take this? Yeah, I think uh, just some real talk here. Uh, getting your first internship is probably the hardest. Uh, so hurdle in this whole process. Um, a lot of companies use prior internship experience as an indicator that you could be successful in their internship. Um, and so there is always going to be a point where uh, you don't have any internship experience. So every one of us uh, on the panel started here um, and this is going to be nerve wracking in many sorts of ways, uh, no matter like what your grades are or uh, what other qualifications you have. So I just wanna put it out there and, and say that you are not alone. Um, I think there is a point for applying for internships because how else are you gonna get your first one? Um, I don't think you should necessarily wait until you do some side projects to, uh, have a more impressive resume, so to speak. Um, but you should definitely, uh, like at the point where you don't have any prior internships yet, uh, the only sort of signal companies have would be, um, have you had experience building software? One such uh, opportunity you can demonstrate that is through Orbital, right? Like that's one of the projects that you probably have, would have built. Um, having, uh, maybe another one or two more things might be useful. Um, I think even if you haven't done like side projects or like open source or whatever it is, uh, you can also put um, projects that you have done from your classes. I think those are also key in demonstrating uh, your skills in building software or even just like programs, even, even, if, even if it's not like software that people can use uh, on, a, on a practical basis. Um, and so TLDR, uh, you have to demonstrate some uh, skills and uh, use whatever you have done in, in, the, in the past to demonstrate those uh, uh, until you get your first internship. I think I can add on one very quick point to what Kevin said just now. Earlier, we talked about building your own projects and there's loads of things out there that you can just try building to get yourself familiar with uh, different software engineering uh, stacks, different areas of software engineering. And I think that's a very good starting point for building projects because it's guided and it gives you the experience and uh, exposure that you need to understand how these kinds of projects work. Um, okay, so last two questions. Um, let's look at this. So around how many applications did you send out during each internship season? Do you keep track of them? And if so, what are some tools you use to keep track? So I think I can take this. Um, Last season, I sent out 100 plus applications of which uh, to, because of COVID and because of the fact that I had just recently only taken um, 2040, only two resulted in interviews. I don't think everyone else's rates are this bad, uh, but it kind of explains that th this is quite normal, right? Um, I personally use Notion to keep track of my internships and I think it's a pretty common um, tool so Notion, Trello, or something like that to keep track of the internships uh, that you want to apply for. But when you look them up, uh, then you can just put the link into it and then you can keep track of them once you have applied and then move them into like a done column or something of that sort. So I think something like that is quite uh, beneficial to tracking where you've applied, where you haven't applied and that sort of thing. Uh, last question we've got before we wrap up and move to breakout rooms. Uh, when companies say that they're looking for people who graduate in 2022 or 23, uh, but I graduate in 2024, is it still wise to apply if I really want to go to that company? And therefore, is it true that uh, this particular requirement exists? So actually, I think, Kenneth, um, you're best suited to explain this. Uh, would you like to answer this? Yeah, so I think uh, understanding this uh, is... The, the best way to understand this is to look at it from a company's perspective. Um, and I think this is often a, 
uh, perspective that people don't consider enough uh, when sort of wrapping your mind around this whole process. Um, so companies want interns. Um, companies also want talent, right? Okay, so sorry, let me, let me start over again. Companies want software engineering or other sorts of talent to do things in their company. Uh, the best way to do that is through hiring people who have graduated and can work full-time, right? Interns have a very high cost uh, in terms of the time that you are taking from mentorship. Um, and ideally, in interns are net positive where you contribute more than you the time you take, um, but this isn't necessarily true. And you know, companies are always taking risks uh, with taking on interns. Um, and so this requirement is so that uh, when companies take on interns, the priority is in converting them for graduation. Um, sometimes if you're graduating a long time from now, it's really hard for uh, companies to uh, know that you are able to come back and work full time uh, with them after you finish your internship. Um, so I say that this uh, requirement, if companies put it out there, is pretty true, and companies will, you know, inevitably prioritize people uh, who can graduate in particular uh, years. That said, um, I think you would be uh, so if you don't apply, your chances are zero, right? Um, if you apply, maybe it's non-zero. Um, and say if you have uh, at the same time, I think you, should, you also want to like prioritize the time you spend on applications. So for this type of company, I think uh, if they are putting out their requirements like that pretty uh, openly, I think the chances would be pretty low if you're not uh, meeting their graduation timeline. Um, and so it probably makes more sense to spend your time going for other companies. But that said, I think if you have uh, a pretty good set of skills and experience um, that people who are graduating at the same time you might not have, then I think it's still worth applying uh, because I think if you have pretty good uh, skills and experience, it, it shows that maybe the company can take a chance on you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Kenneth. I think this brings us to the end of the panel session. Um, we're going to move to breakout rooms. I need to refresh this slide. Just give me a moment. Uh, okay, yeah. So we're going to move into breakout rooms now. Um, so anyone who would like to join breakout rooms with uh, specific presenters, please feel free to, to join it. Uh, okay, oops. Moment. Okay, yeah. So um, these are the breakout rooms. Um, they should already be open. And you guys can join these rooms with uh, the re relevant panelists. We've also got the QR code here for feedback. If you guys would like to give us feedback on today's session or what went well and what could be possibly improved, the slides are available here as well. And this will eventually be uploaded onto the NUS Hackers um, YouTube channel. Uh, so we'll be here if you guys have any other questions, but please feel free to join the breakout rooms. <laughs>